Joining me is Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. He's a Democratic congressman from New York's 8th District, which includes Brooklyn and Queens. Congressman, pleasure to speak with you. Uh, my producer the other day was flipping through C-SPAN in the evening, and you were in the House chamber with uh, Congressman Stephen Horsford from Nevada, and you were talking about the Voting Rights Act. And I want to get into the details of that. But first, when you do a speech like this in the evening with almost no one in the House, is the... Is the goal to get certain things in the record to later be referred to? Is the idea to, to reach the C-SPAN audience? We see these, this a lot, and we're kind of curious. What's the goal of that type of speech? Well, it's twofold, and I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to be on the show uh, and for you uh, covering this issue. First, uh, it is a matter of putting items into the congressional record uh, related to matters of importance to the American people. But second, and equally, if not more importantly, uh, it provides members of Congress an opportunity to talk directly to the American people from the floor of the United States House of Representatives on an issue of great significance. In this instance, uh, it related to the Supreme Court oral argument that was taking place on the matter of whether Congress properly reauthorized Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. So let's get into that. The Supreme Court is hearing that we, we may see Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act struck down, and we're seeing all sorts of arguments from, from Supreme Court justices, from Republicans, from all sorts of different groups. I want to talk first about uh, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia's comments that uh, the Voting Rights Act is a racial entitlement. And what does it mean so shortly after an election cycle where the Voting Rights Act worked in Texas, in South Carolina, in so many other states, to say that it's a racial entitlement? What do you make of those comments? Well, it was a very shocking and disturbing statement, particularly coming from a justice of the United States Supreme Court. It was problematic on so many different levels, but I appreciate you giving me the opportunity uh, to address it. First, the right to vote without obstruction on the basis of race, color, not a racial entitlement. It's a fundamental right important to the integrity of our democracy. It's a right that actually was enshrined in our Constitution, passed in the United States Congress in 1869, and thereafter ratified uh, by the states of the Union at that particular time in 1870 in the 15th Amendment. And so the 1965 Voting Rights Act and the Section 5 preclearance provision uh, were put into place almost 100 years after the attack in order to bring that constitutional right to vote to life because so many states, particularly in the Deep South, had engaged in legislative shenanigans like poll taxes and literacy tests and grandfather clauses in order to deny African Americans and others with their right to participate in American democracy. What also is disturbing about the comment is that it clearly was made in order to mask Judge Scalia's hypocrisy on the question of whether overturning Section 5 would be an act of judicial activism. Now, Justice Scalia and a lot of the conservative uh, justices and members of the federal bench and the bar make a big deal about judges not being activists. Mind you, David, they were, of course, activists in 2000 in Bush v. Gore when they halted a state electoral proceeding down in Florida in order to give the election to George W. Bush. So they've already been exposed as hypocrites on the question of judicial activism. But in this instance, in uh, 2006, I believe it was when Congress reauthorized the Voting Rights Act. It was an overwhelmingly bipartisan vote. More than 300 members of the 390 members of the House of Representatives, only 435 in the chamber, voted to reauthorize it, Republicans and Democrats. And the vote in the Senate was 98 to zero. And so you had a bipartisan uh, vote that supported reauthorization. And so what Justice Scalia is trying to do is to find a way to overturn that congressional act, which he should be given deference to as an adherent to the school of judicial restraint. And so he brings in the notion of racial entitlement. This is a key point, David. He says, well, 
even though it was an overwhelmingly uh, supported vote by both Democrats and Republicans, it's a racial entitlement, and Congress is reluctant to get rid of racial entitlements. And so that explains, in his mind, the reason for the strongly bipartisan support for reauthorization to give him an avenue to delegitimize the vote, presumably to try and overturn Section 5. Yeah, if that's not judicial activism, I don't know what is. Congressman, you know what's, what's interesting to me? Since the Voting Rights Act was passed through, I would say, the 2010 election, we saw widespread attempts for voter suppression. We, we saw that ever, straight through. However, in 2010 and 2012, we started seeing allegations of voter fraud, which is almost non-existent, mind you. And now we are seeing the attempt to possibly overturn Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. What happened before the 2010 election that changed the dynamic of the discussion around voting rights? It's a great question. It's a very puzzling uh, issue for many of us who are students of history. Uh, since the Voting Rights Act was passed in uh, 1965, what we've seen is the election of several presidents, Democrats and Republicans, Richard Nixon, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush uh, in 2000 and 2004. I would note, parenthetically, in 2000, there were legitimate reasons to be concerned about the results coming out of Florida, but we didn't see an explosion of anxiety about voter fraud, voter fraud alleged voter fraud in any of those instances. But coincidentally, I guess, in 2008, Barack Obama is elected, still no evidence of voter fraud, but all of a sudden there's this outbreak of anxiety all across the country when the Tea Party wave was swept into power in 2010. And so subsequent to that, 180 different proposed laws voter suppression laws were introduced in 41 states. The American people can be the ones to judge if there's cause and effect related to the election of Barack Obama, but it is curious and strange to many of us that this concern wasn't triggered until our current president's historic election in 2008. It's certainly curious. I know we have limited time, so in the last minute or so we have, if we assume that uh, maybe we don't need the Voting Rights Act anymore, as some are arguing, and I'm not conceding that by any means, but just following the argument that's being made, where else would we make this argument? For example, if we didn't have many bank robberies because bank robberies weren't allowed and the punishment was strict, would we say, let's remove the laws against bank robbery because nobody's really doing it? Where else would we apply this logic, Congressman? Uh, it's a very wonderful question, and I don't think there's any other meaningful area where we would essentially conclude that the law has been effective in stopping un-American activity, which was denying people the right to vote and participate in our democracy on the basis of their color. It's universally acknowledged and recognized that the Voting Rights Act and the Section 5 preclearance provision has been one of the most effective statutes ever passed by the United States Congress, that we can do away with it, particularly given the avalanche of voter suppression activity. And uh, to your point, it's also important to note that the Voting Rights Act, Section 5 preclearance provision, as recently as last year, was effective in stopping laws designed to undermine the ability for people of color, African Americans and Latinos, to participate in Texas, in South Carolina, and has held up such voter suppression activity in Florida. And so it remains as relevant today as it was in 1965, and that's why we're hopeful that five justices on the Supreme Court will do the right thing, defer to Congress's considerable judgment, 15,000 pages of testimony on the record, significant hearings all over the United States of America that came to the conclusion that the Voting Rights Act Section 5 preclearance provision should continue. We've been speaking with Democratic Congressman from New York's 8th District, Hakeem Jeffries. Congressman, real pleasure to have you on. Thanks for doing this. Thank you for having me on.